thank you for inviting me to present as one of the Schumacher lectures. So the title of my presentation is The SDGs in the Post-COVID World. And the SDGs was a fantastic achievement when the whole world agreed on 17 sustainable development goals for the first time, with goals on hunger, on education, combating climate change, and biodiversity. And the same year, 2015, the world also agreed on the Paris Climate Agreement, another major achievement. But now we are five years down the line, and instead of focusing on this, all eyes and all politicians are focusing on this, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic. But how will the SDGs and the Agenda 2030 do in a post-COVID world? This is an overview of my presentation. I will begin with asking the question, should the SDGs be reached? And that relates a bit to uh, Catherine Trebek's presentation yesterday. Then I will ask, will the SDGs be reached? Reporting from the Club of Rome report, transformation is feasible. And then I will ask the question, what is needed for the SDGs to be reached? Focusing on transformation. So, should the SDGs be reached? Is this a good idea? There is a social critique and an environmental critique against the SDGs. So, this is a quote from Philip Alstom at New York University School of Law, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights between 2014 and 2020. And he says, economic growth is at the core of the SDGs. And this is problematic because, and then he says, but after decades of unparalleled growth, the primary beneficiaries have been the wealthiest. Rather than an end to poverty, unbridled growth has brought extreme inequality, widespread precarity in a world of plenty, roiling discontent and climate change, which will take the greatest toll on the world's poor. And a recent article in Nature Sustainability says, while most countries are progressing well towards environmental SDGs, this has little relationship with actual biodiversity conservation and instead better represent socioeconomic development. If this continues, the SDGs will likely serve as a smokescreen for further environmental destruction throughout the decade. So these are quite troublesome critiques against the SDGs. And if we look at data, here on the x-axis, we have the Human Development Index from the United Nations Development Program, which is, which is an index of income per person, average lifetime and years of schooling for all countries in the world. And on the y-axis, we have the ecological footprint, which represents how much of the Earth's bioproductive area that is needed to provide for that development. And you see the Global Sustainable Development Quadrant is blank, as also Catherine Trebek said yesterday. So this is in the Global Sustainable Development Quadrant, this is where we all need to be in order to have a limited ecological footprint and positive social development. And if you see the numbers on the right, we have the top 10 or so countries scoring highest on the SDG index. And here on the left, we have the countries scoring the least on the SDG index. So this shows that the SDGs, they do not in a good way represent positive sustainability or, or sustainable development because then we will see other countries on the top. And why is it so? Why do the SDGs not sufficiently incorporate social development and environmental degradation? One explanation is the SDGs are a politically negotiated product, and then they represent what the countries that were at the table from the SDGs or negotiated their worldviews and their perspectives. 
Another one related to this is that the SDGs then reflect the Keynesian economic discourse and have left many voices unheard. So they focus very much on investment, investment policies for social development, and which is reflecting Keynesian economic discourse and forgetting perhaps about other sustainability discussions. And another that Jennifer Hinton mentioned on Monday was is the political capture, that there are elites, political and financial elites that have gained so much power in the, on the political agenda so they can influence these kind of negotiations so that they, in the end, the end product is not good enough. And uh, Sander van der Love, in a book that I will come back to, argues that the STDs are dominated by the idea of progress, that we all the time will be moved towards better and better and more and more, and that this is something positive. So what can we do with the SDGs then? One way to show that we are, need, we are um, embedded in the biosphere and that we, our development needs to be part of this or, and take it into consideration, our dependence on a well-functioning biosphere is in this picture, I think, represented quite well. So here we have the same circles that Jennifer Hinton presented on Monday, where we have the society as a subsector of the larger biosphere. So society is dependent on a well-functioning biosphere. And then the economy, yet again, is a subsector of the society. And in the book that I mentioned, with the title Social Sustainability, Past and the Future, Sander argues that instead of basing, it, basing the development on progress and the goals on progress, it's wiser to develop a wider plurality of futures and trajectories, taking different contextual developments and different worldviews into account. And I also think that we can find inspirations in the core principles of the 2030 Agenda, which includes universality, that the agenda, in difference for, to the predecessors, the Millennium Development Goals, is an agenda for all countries. And the second principle of leaving no one behind. The third principle of interconnectedness and indivisibility, that all the goals are important and all are part of a web of causal relationships and everything is dependent on everything. This brings very much of the systems view that is needed to reach the SDGs, I think. And inclusiveness, that they are inviting for different views and that it's not an agenda only for the government, but different stakeholders should take part of it. And multi-stakeholder partnerships is this kind of the governments and different actors reaching out to each other. And based on this last multi-stakeholder partnership, we developed a process, and this is a paper in review with the title Three Horizons for the SDGs, a cross-scale participatory approach for transformative pathways. That is building very much on Sanders' argumentations. So we embarked from the question, who develops the future vision? And questions that who, who is today suggesting the future? Are there any alternative? Can we invite other perspectives? And the second part, to change the regional and local dynamics, in this case, to reach the SDGs within the planetary boundaries, different narratives need to be developed. And the Agenda 2030 needs to be seen from different perspectives. So based on this, we developed a participatory approach to get different perspectives on the SDGs with the following premises. We wanted systems perspective and SDG integration. We wanted to hear multiple perspectives and we wanted the participants in the processes to feel ownership of the pathway narratives that were being developed. I will now show a short film that we've made for the process we designed. 
big question is can the SDGs be reached within the planetary boundaries and what are the likely pathways to get there? We are in Kigali, Rwanda and uh, we are trying to get perspectives from different parts of Africa on how these pathways to reach the SDGs within the planetary boundaries can look like. is based on a pathways approach to give voice to African aspirations in relation to the SDGs, with two goals in mind. First, to provide relevant insights to policymakers involved in the SDG implementation, but also to provide input to the design of alternative global and regional scenarios, bridging the scales and unveiling tensions between possible pathways. To transform a society or you want to transform your whole self, you've got to figure out where the points of power are. And then you know appropriately how to build the necessary coalitions of people or organizations so that you can tackle the status quo scenarios that we want to change. What we need to do is to help build a wider bottom-up movement into this direction. So this, the world, the second dialogue on the world in uh, African dialogue on the world in 2050 took place in November 2018 and was the first attempt to use this new uh, process, participatory process that we developed. It took part in uh, Rwanda and it was together with a center working on the SDGs in Sub-Saharan Africa. So uh, the process that we, we used, we embarked from the three horizons and the process was three horizons for the SDGs. We began with focusing on, I mean, this is a process that had been developed and used quite a lot before by Sharp and others. And it consists of three horizons. We chose to fo start focusing on horizon three, which represent the system we want to transform to, by asking the questions, how does desirable future look like to 2050 and beyond? And then the second question related to the system we want to transform from, so what are the dominating features of today that we want to leave? And then the third horizon, uh, the second horizon was our third step, focusing on what changes are needed to break from the current dominant features and reach these desirable futures. We started with the first desired future and the second present concerns, as I said, and then we were divided into four different groups to develop four different STD narratives, focusing on agriculture and um, food systems. So we had a world cafe where the participants from the different groups rotated to hear about the different ideas and different visions. And then we, con we reflected how these relates to the global perspectives, not only the global perspective of the business as usual, but the ones that are represented in what, what is called shared socioeconomic pathways that are used for the IPCC climate discussions. And then we had the last step, how to get to the cyber future. And then we discussed the convergences and divergences. So what are the tensions between different ideas and pathways forward? So the outcome of each of these steps was this, the diagram where we had the different issues that we were discussing. We had a list of divergences where different participants had different views on the way forward. And then we had also a creative product, which was a way to, to ground the ideas in a story. And some participants made hashtags presenting their future. And some wrote letters from the future to the present. This in order to make the ideas of the future more real. And I will, I will, uh, I've chosen one of the divergences to look at. It was a big discussion on population where some argue that a growing population is problematic following this brown arrow on the left. 
because a growing population increases the consumption footprint, which increases natural resource use and food consumption, which is bad for food security. While others participants focus on that the growing population increases the workforce, which spur innovations and efficiency, which lowers the consumption footprint, and which is also good as it increases the production, and then it's positive for food, food security. So this is just one example of the outcome of uh, discussions that we're focusing in the different groups. So what are the takeaways from this process? I think the main one is that SDGs they need this kind of local groundings and can be realized through locally sensitive strategies, providing an integrated entry point. So the, SDG, the core principles of the SDGs are very important in this, providing integration and focus on SSU. And that building such integrated vision strategies are needed to support sustainability transformations and this requires broad societal participation. So the agenda have to be, a lot of people have to work together to realize the agenda. And this is a way to do this. And I also think that contrasting views need to be captured. It's important to focus on the tensions in order to ask the important questions. And how does this relate to the COVID-19? So one, one thing that, that I've been thinking of is the COVID responses are an example of how multiple perspectives are needed. It's not only the epidemiologists, but also other that should take part of the discussion on the way forward such as nurses, such as the, the greater public, such as uh, mathematicians and people with different knowledges. And then major external jolts, such as the COVID-19, could provide a window of opportunity for non-state actors. And then this process is also then uh, uh, giving that grounding. So now I have gone through the first question, I will move to the second. Will the SDGs be reached? Now we'll report from the work with transformation is feasible report. Can we achieve the SDGs within planetary boundaries? Is the was the major question for this work? And this is how the report looked like. Uh, transformation is feasible. We to the Club of Rome 2018 for the 50th anniversary. And the planetary boundaries are nine boundaries which we have to stay within in order to ensure Holocene-like development. So basically not, not to risk big environmental disruptions in the future. And as has been mentioned earlier today, Kate Rayworth has put the SDGs in the context of, of the planetary boundaries and we need we have social thresholds we need to reach above, but we have the planetary boundaries then that we have to stay within. So combining these two, which is the same as the focus in our project. So the question was, can we find a pathway to meet the SDGs within planetary boundaries by 2050 and beyond? So the SDGs, they have a timeframe to 2030, and then we chose to have a longer time horizon in order to focus on also planetary changes, which are in general much lower. The core team uh, it was led by Jürgen Randers, who was one of the co-authors of the Limits to Growth report in, of 1972 that Catherine Trebek mentioned yesterday. And Perez Ben Stockness, who is a psychologist at the Norwegian Business School. Ulrik Kolyk, a system dynamics modeler. And Johan Rockström, Sarah Cornell and me, at Stockholm Resilience Center. And new one is now at PIC. So the inputs of the model that we developed that we have called R3 was a socioeconomic system with a based on planetary boundaries, science and population growth. We had different policy levers for different scenarios, incorporating growth rates, poverty, jobs, inequality, adjustments and policies Focusing, focusing, focusing on energy, policy focusing on food and agriculture, education, gender. And then this then gave rise to the outcomes 
measured as different SDG success scores of between zero and 17, number of SDGs reached. And then the other was then, are, is this safely within the planetary boundaries? How many of the nine planetary boundaries are we staying within? And based on this, we have four different scenarios. This is how the, the model as a whole, a sketch of the model as a whole looks like. But don't worry, I won't go through all the details that I can if you want afterwards. So here, but then you may ask, how can one say something about quality education or like the expected years of schooling in 2050? Well, we looked at the historical development of this. So here in this graph, we have GDP per person on the x-axis and expected years of schooling on the y-axis. And the yellow line represents that the goal is half reached and the green line that the SDG is reached. So this is SDG4. So we have here the different world regions in the model. And when I play, we can see how they have moved historically from 1990 and then up to 2015 when we have the latest data points. So we see, we see a very clear pattern here. And these patterns we also saw when it comes to other goals and we could use it to, to uh, for model calibration. So, we have, so then we can calculate based on these different functions for the different regions. And here you see when it comes to the four first SD, social SDGs, or SDGs, so no poverty, zero hunger, wealth, health and well-being, and um, education. So we see very similar clear patterns of many of the SDGs. So historically, when we know historically how they have developed, if we have a good idea of how the future will be developed develop when it comes to GDP per person, we can continue to sketch. And this is what we did. And this is part of the input to the model. And similar data analysis was done for most of the, these social SDGs. So the first scenario that I would like to show is the same scenario. What if from now we continue with conventional efforts, the same growth rates as today? So this is how we reach a business as usual scenario that we call the same. How will the world score? That this leads to an unsafe territory in the second half of the century. The countries and the regions of the world commit to deliver on all SDGs, but mostly talk about sustainability. There's not much action done on actually reaching the SDGs. Poorer regions, here we can see Africa, sub, Africa and south of Sahara and the Indian subcontinent, for example, are doing very good initially and catch up in periods of higher growth. But there's increased inequality, which may cause social unrest. And as you see, the richer regions of the US and other rich countries are slowly going down as the environment is degraded. This is how, we, if we look 2010, 2030, and 2050, this is how the development looked like for the different regions. Here you can also see our regional differentiations in the model. So this does not look like a great future of reaching the SDGs. None of the regions are close to reaching all 17 SDGs. And some are actually moving backwards, as I mentioned before. So this is very serious. The world's SDGs success scores move slightly upwards, but not much and not enough to reach the SDGs. We want to be in the top where the green area begins. And it begins to go move downwards. And the Earth safety margin is going down, which means that we are not staying within the safe operating space of the planetary boundaries. We are moving out from more and more of the planetary boundary. So here in this graph, which I will present some different versions of. We have the safe operating space on the y-axis, which is the nine planetary boundaries, 
And on the x-axis, we have the SDGs. So we want to be in the upper right corner of this graph. And this is how we have developed since 1980, the world as a whole. So we have reached slightly better when it comes to social and socioeconomic SDGs, but at the expense of a further degraded environment. And if we continue with business as usual, the situation is slightly improved when it comes to the SDGs, but again, at the expense of a very uncertain future past 2050. How about faster growth, the second scenario? Yeah, then we may reach a few more of the socioeconomic SDGs, but we may be in even worse position when it comes to safe operating space in the longer term. So by this modeling of results and simulations, we were very hustled and felt very troubled. It doesn't look very well. But if we try harder on all the fronts, and this is representing very, very big change in policies on all the SDGs, focusing on reaching the social and economic SDGs and also on change in energy, we would see a slight, in the end, as we move towards 2050, we would begin to see moving within the safe operating space of the planetary boundaries. But it does not look good far. It looks far from good enough, unfortunately. And why is this? One way to show it that I have chosen to represent the Earth 3 model is by this causal loop diagram. So here we see arrows representing a positive causal relationship. So we have an, have an economy and society in which pro, increase in production increases the physical capital, which is reinvested in production capacity, which is increasing the annual production. So this is a production reinforcing loop. So that loop is connected to another loop of the social ecological collapse counteracting loop, where an increase in production increases the material throughput, which puts pressures on the planetary boundaries and risking a social ecological collapse. So this is how we slowly move out from the planetary boundaries. And production partly is used to fulfill human needs. And that is positive for reaching human needs, human capabilities, and human well being, which is also, of course, affected by distribution and other well being contributing factors. But there's also a lot of consumption that does not fulfill human needs, that does not provide a positive future development. So we have a system where we maximize production instead of maximizing reaching human needs and doing this within the planetary boundaries. And what is driving, what has been driving the fulfilling of human needs in the past, as Catherine Trebek mentioned, is maybe not doing it now. And instead, this social ecological collapse contracting loop is more and more dominating. So what are the messages from this? The current business as usual type of behavior comes at the very high cost of environmental degradation. And the SDGs will not be reached without a fundamental transformation of the combined human and earth systems. So we really, really need to change. So what does COVID-19, how does COVID-19 relate to this? Well, some people argue that the business as usual has already been interrupted this may serve as an opportunity to find a different development trajectory. Despite, of course, the, the extreme suffering in this way. And as someone wrote in the chat on Monday's talk, the future is not what it used to be. Please identify yourself if you're in this discussion as well in the chat. I forgot who it was. So the COVID-19 puts the world as a crossroads. So it could be seen as a window of opportunity to choose the different trajectory or return to the old normal. So now I have, I'm moving to my last question. What is needed for the SDGs to be reached? 
So as I showed, these were the three first scenarios that we found in the report. And we thought what would be needed to move even better up in the upper right corner, where we would move even further in within the planetary boundaries and where we would reach more of the SDGs. Is this possible? So we came up with five transformational policies. The first one incorporates rapid renewable energy growth, halving emission every decade from 2020 onwards. This is the least that is needed in order to uh, live up to the Paris Climate Agreement of 1.5 degrees. And this can be done both by switching, of course, to renewables, but also by energy saving. Second, accelerated sustainable food chains by increasing the sustainability of the current food production. And third, new development models in the poorer countries, copying the positive aspects of South Korea, China, and Ethiopia, for example. Now choose picking the, the cherries, picking the good parts of these countries, how they, have, how they have developed with quite much state intervention, for example. And fourth, active inequality reduction, ensuring that the 10% richest only capture uh, up to 40% of incomes and not more. And in most countries, this is not the case, but in some, the most equal countries of the world are still within this. And then fifth, investment in education to all, gender equality, health and family planning. So in really investing in the social areas of the SDGs, which improves well-being and also could also reduce ecological footprint, partly by limiting population growth. So with all these policies together, how will we score? Then, yes, we managed to see a positive development and we're slowly moving into the green area. But radical changes are needed. Transformation is an incredible opportunity that we really need to take. I have also been part of the World in 2050, which is a global research initiative focusing on the SDGs, on research on the SDGs, which has, has the same frame as our report, the SDGs within the planetary boundaries. And yesterday we, we, we launched our third report and I will present some of from that. So one, one thing is the six transformation or six domains of transformations which are needed to reach the SDGs. This has been, been presented in the Nature Sustainability article and it's also in the first report of 2018 with small slight changes now with a focus on COVID-19. And the domains are human capacity, demography and health, consumption and production, decarbonization and energy, food, biosphere and water, smart cities and digital revolution. So some of the main, this is the report, the front of the report, innovation for sustainability, pathways to an efficient and sufficient post pandemic future. And some of the main key messages that I would like to mention to you is that COVID-19 is a threat to humanity, especially for already deprived groups, but it's also challenging the status quo, providing opportunity for change, just like I mentioned before. And inequalities is in focus, which is quite interesting for this big research group, because it has not been so much focusing on inequality in the part. And these six transformations that I mentioned are re-emphasized. And it's mentioned that innovations have both positive and negative outcomes. And that it, there are political choices that decide this. And transforming the service provisioning systems by safeguarding human needs and sharing available resources is needed. And some of the figures from the report that I'm very happy to, to find there and to show you is this one, which very much represents what Catherine Trebek talked about yesterday, that the current economic growth has had diminishing marginal returns 
when it comes to well-being and even negative so if on the y-axis here we have consumption and on the x-axis well-being so above basic excess we can move upwards in well-being by consuming more up to decent living standards and then there is sufficient th sufficiency threshold and above the sufficiency threshold more consumption more service provision does not provide more well-being but rather the opposite an example of this could be obesity and another figure in the report that i was very happy to find there is this so the report really focusing on human needs and human capabilities referring to max neff who has been referred to earlier this week by both Jennifer Hinton and Catherine Trebek and uh, Doyle and Go, who also have another framework of human needs, what, what constitutes actual human needs that we should strive for. And also central capabilities, which is a concept by Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum, capability approach, which suggests that the goal should be to create capabilities for people to do and be what they want to do and be which are best, I think, measured by referring to different measures of human needs. So takeaways from this last part of my presentation. The future is in our hands, safeguarding human needs and sharing available resources fairly within planetary boundaries is needed. Human needs are providing useful framework combined with the planetary boundaries and I think they together reflect very good parts of the Agenda 2030 ambitions captured in the principles I began with. So concluding, uh, the 2030 Agenda needs local grounding and can be reinterpreted and realized through locally sensitive strategies providing an integrative entry point. The SDGs will not be reached without transformative changes. We really need to change the way we do things. And thirdly, safeguarding human needs and sharing available resources fairly within planetary boundaries needed. The future is not predetermined, but the future is in our hands to change. <laughs>